Hello everyone, my name is um, Kevin Langrij and this is what I do. Pretty cool, eh? So, um, yeah, I'm a professional kite surfer. I get the chance to uh, travel all around the world, go to a lot of cool places, and uh, meet a lot of cool people. And um, I actually managed to um, find a passion, and I make a living out of it. And um, that's like living the dream. This clicker doesn't... Ah, there we go. And uh, one of my first dreams that I can remember was that um, I wanted to fly. And as you can see here, this picture is taken uh, in South Africa during one of the biggest kite surf competitions we have in South Africa, the king of the air. And um, yeah, so my biggest or my first dream I can remember was that I was able, able to fly. And with kite surfing, you can actually do that. But it all started like this. Uh, when I was a little boy, I was seven years old, and um, I was flying kites on the beach. And that was actually the first air I was getting off a kite. And I was basically hooked from day one. I was like, wow, this, I want to do this every day. But unfortunately, there was not wind every day. So I had to do something on the no wind days. And I started surfing. I got into that. And I got super hooked on that as well. And I was like, wow, I found two super awesome sports that I can pretty much do almost every day. If it's windy, I can go fly kites on the beach. If there's no wind, I can go surfing. And I grew up in this little uh, beach town um, called Noordwijk. So I could just take my bike, cycle to the beach, and do my thing. And then back in 2000, um, kite surfing started. And when I saw that for the first time, I was hooked from day one. You know, I was able to fly my kite uh, on the beach and surf at the same time. So, yeah, the middle picture is actually me with my first setup, my wetsuit, and my, uh, and my first kite. And um, that's actually um, a little bit how it started. What have you with Robbie Nash? And this is me. Yeah, as you see, do I just kite surf. Het is gewoon zo, zo mooi hoe hij dat gewoon doet, die sprongen en het is gewoon zo gaaf, dat allemaal. Ja, zo wil ik ook worden. Kiteboarding. Waar moet dat met jou naartoe? Ik hoop naar Hawaii. Het, het schijnt daar dat het heel erg goed is. Hoge golven, goede wind. En uh, ja, dan moet het wel lukken. <laughs> well, it's crazy how time flies, eh? If I look at this back, it's, this is back in 2001. And um, yeah, so my passion, that was kite surfing. And um, I had the opportunity back in 2001 to, uh, to meet some of my heroes. Um, there was a World Cup in, in Scheveningen. And um, I got invited there and I did a demo with one of my legends called um, Robbie Nash and uh, Max Bow. And that was like, when I saw those guys, you know, they were able to travel around the world and do something they love to do and, and make a little bit of money off it as well. And I was like, I got so inspired by these uh, two guys that I knew from when I was 12 years old, this is where I'm gonna go. I, I wanna become a professional kiteboarder. But you know, you're 12 years old and um, how in the world do you become a professional kiteboarder? You know, it's a brand new sport. There's no career path. Uh, my parents didn't have enough money to send me all around the world to do competitions. Um, so I had to find some sponsors. And mainly because I did a demo that one day with, with my heroes, um, O'Neill and Nash, they saw me there and they were like, wow, that, that looks cool, we got, we're gonna sponsor you. And that really helped me to have a little bit of financing and to, to start chasing my dream of becoming a professional kite surfer. But then the next question was, um, what do sponsors want? I'm 12 years old, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm just following my passion and, and this is where I wanna go. But I knew I had to do something with exposure. That's why sponsors sponsor you to get exposure for their brands. Um, 
So I started to just follow my path, and I was getting a, sometimes I was getting a bit of a, a, a TV interview here and a magazine article there, but it wasn't really taking off. So I was a bit bummed about that. And then um, I was like, you know what, maybe the next solution would be to become world champion, to get a bit more media exposure. It was also the next uh, dream of mine to, to become real champion. You know, I got, so, I, I got so much pleasure out of the sport that I wanted to see if I could become the best kite surfer in the world. I know it was a, a high bar to set, but I knew I wanted to do that, and I set my goals on it, and I, I just went for it. And then back in 2009, I managed to become real champion. It took me uh, quite a lot of uh, time and dedication to... Um, to get this title, I managed to get a second place three times in a row, and that was, uh, that was something you don't want to be, you know? If you want to be the best, you don't want to become second, because that feels like the first loser. So finally, in New Caledonia, I managed to um, yeah, win my first world title, and that was like a dream come true. And at that moment, I was like, okay, you know, I, I became world champion, I'm the best in the world now, now the mainstream media must pick it up. And they sort of did, but not really. As you can see, the soccer players were getting a bigger picture than me becoming world champion. And um, yeah, that, that frustrated me a little bit. Um, so I had to think about something new, something exciting, something um, fun and different because, you know, I was not going to compete with soccer and tennis because they were getting way more exposure than I was going to get. And then another thing was I wanted to get my stuff on TV. But to go on TV cost a lot of money. You know, I was doing, um, I was doing 30 trips a year and on average to, to send the whole camera crew on a trip with me would cost around 10,000 euros, I would say. So if you do 10,000 10, euros times 30, that was going to be a lot of money. And I didn't have those, that money. And my sponsors didn't want to put that much money into me. They, they believed in me, but 300,000 euros is quite a lot of money. So we came up with a movie called Hidden Lines. And this was a movie about three friends. And we wanted to go to three uh, dream locations and just go on an absolute awesome mission and capture that. Um, we were like, you know what? We, we're not gonna focus on the mainstream media like, like TV and newspapers and magazines and radio because like from my experience, they weren't really picking up a niche sport. And um, even if you win a real title, they weren't picking it up. And at that time, when we made this movie, social media was starting to, starting to grow bigger. So we decided with this movie, you know what? We're just gonna do everything online. We're just, just gonna focus on that and see, see what happens. So we did the trip, we filmed the trailer, we threw it online and it literally exploded. Everyone was talking about it just with the trailer. And that gave us so much you know, excitement. We were like, whoa, we didn't even show the movie yet. <laughs> and so many people are talking about it already. And then um, the movie came out and uh, we did a couple of premieres all around, pretty much all around the world. And everywhere we went, we, we got a lot of cool response. But the biggest thing was that online we were getting even more response. So because of that, I decided to create my own social media platform. And, um, and especially after we did Hidden Lines and I saw the online side was so successful for a niche sport like kite surfing, and kiting is a very visual sport, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna open up an Instagram account, just post a bunch of cool pictures, and just see, see how it goes. And um, yeah, that was, that was actually going pretty well. Um, but then I had one more challenge. How am I gonna capture all these, um, all, the, all the content, all the pictures and videos, you know, to send the whole camera crew with me all around the world was gonna cost me a lot of money. But then the technology was evolving and um, the cameras were getting bigger or smaller 
and the technology of computers were, was getting bigger. So now I had the opportunity to actually bring a camera crew around, with me around the world 24-7. And my camera crew is actually this small. It fits in your pocket. And I can just hit record and film some cool stuff and then post it that same day. And that technology has made it possible for me to uh, actually make a living. You know, I can, now I can go to places, to a competition, and create my own, or like I've created my own audience, and with cool content, I can keep my people updated and create more value to myself as a, as a, as a brand and as an athlete. And then some of the stuff I was uh, able to capture was this, and it's even like places where normal camera people can't go. That's where I can go right now. So it's, it's, it's pretty much, thank you. So basically what happens now, it's, it's basically a click of a button. I can record something, I can upload it to my computer, and I can upload it on Facebook or Instagram. And how cool is that? The technology is pretty awesome. And um, I'm, I'm really happy it's there. But then, I ran into the next problem, you know, that there's Instagram and there's Facebook and there's uh, stories you can tell. But then all of a sudden I was like, you know, sometimes I was doing a trip and I had so much content that I didn't know what, where to put it. So I decided to open up a YouTube channel and start a vlog. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to give it a go, see where it goes and just tell my stories. And that's what I did. Um, I still I have a couple of followers, but not that much. So maybe if you guys want to subscribe, <laughs> make sure to do that. Um, so this, these, these online platforms really gave me um, an opportunity to tell my story. And I, all of a sudden, you know, I, I didn't need the mainstream media to follow me, or I didn't need, well, of course you need results because that creates cool stories and cool content. But all of a sudden, I can do everything myself. And this way, I can keep on following my dreams, and that is flying. And yeah, I think I still have the coolest job in the world, don't you guys think? And uh, I want to thank, maybe some of you guys have helped um, develop this technology that I can, I can capture all this and share it with the rest of the world. And I want to thank you guys for, um, for making this possible. And um, thanks for following, that I can still follow my dreams. I still got one little video that I want to show you guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And um, off we go. Oh, wait. Oh, no. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I thought I was there yet. No, this is actually a pretty cool um, picture. This was taken um, a couple months ago during the Red Bull King of the Air. This is one of the biggest kiteboard competitions we have in, um, in South Africa. Um, last year, I... I was training for the event, and just a week before the competition, I was training this brand new trick, and I landed and I broke my ankle. And I had to get surgery, it took me three, four months to get back, back on track. But then finally I got back on track, and this year I, went, I managed to win the king of the air. And it is the biggest competition you can win in kiteboarding. And I think this picture shows quite the excitement I had. And, um, and mainly, and, and the cool thing of this, like winning a competition, it's another story you can tell online and throughout my channels. So, um, yeah, now the, now the real video comes. I thought we were there yet, but this is actually a pretty cool picture, right? <laughs> there we go. Hey ho, on the road again
them, by the way. Some of you probably recognize it. Thank you very much. That was it. See you guys on the water.